Good evening. Uh, we are now being joined by the candidates, and I will introduce our esteemed moderators. First, my name is Esmeralda Simmons. I'm the Executive Director of the Center for Law and Social Justice. The center is a racial justice advocacy institution that's part of this college, Medford College of the City University of New York. I welcome you on behalf of the college, and I hope that you will continue to look at our websites to see all of the magnificent events, community events that we have um, that will not only uh, our film series, our speaker series, our art galleries, that will not only give you information and educate you, but will also raise your spirits. And without further ado, let me introduce the moderators for tonight. From the Center for Law and Social Justice, our general counsel, Noree Daniel Favors. And, and we are partnering with the one and only Brooklyn NAACP. I hope you saw this from the left side. And the co moderator of this program is the magnificent L. Joy Williams. On behalf of President Bill we welcome you to this forum. We ask that you, um, there will be ground rules given, but I'm personally asking each of you to write your questions down. You can, uh, we'll be handing out the cards shortly. Don't wait till the end of the program. Thank you very much. Let the candidate forum begin. Good evening, everyone. Thank you. Now, y'all can do better than that. Please. Come on now. This is not the New York one debate where everybody has to be quiet the entire time. That was quiet. Yeah. <laughs> we definitely want to echo the sentiments uh, given by the Executive Director of the Center for Law and Social Justice, Attorney uh, Esmeralda Simmons. And we do welcome you all here this evening. As you know, this is a quite an auspicious event, and we have some really serious matters on the table. And we are looking so forward to hearing from our candidates who will be speaking with us this evening. Yes, um, this conversation, um, those of you who are RCP'd, hopefully you saw the key themes that we're going to be focusing on, which we'll reintroduce today. But before we bring the candidates up, let's start with some ground rules. Ground rules are good. Yes, so we have ground rules for the candidates, Larry. Yes. So, for those of us in the audience who may not be aware, the ground rules for the candidates are as such. The candidates each pick the number out of a hat before they came on stage to determine the number and the order of opening statements. Each candidate has two minutes for their opening statement and three minutes for their closing statement at the end of the forum. If a candidate arrives prior to the opening statement's beginning, they have forfeited their opening statement. Each candidate has one minute to answer each question. A candidate will be allowed to finish a sentence once started, but the moderators will enforce strict time limits. Cards will be used by a timekeeper who will be seated here in the front who will alert us, the moderators, and the candidates as to when there are 15 seconds remaining for their response and when they must stop. The candidates will not interrupt one another or the moderator during the forum. Uh, yeah, let me pull more on y'all. Don't interrupt me. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know if y'all see me on MSNBC. It's not a good thing. <laughs> All right, now I have ground rules for you, the audience. Yes. Uh, you, by participating and being in this room, I have some ground, we have some ground rules for you as well. So we all know that election day is Tuesday, right? Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Election is Tuesday, right? Yes. Yeah. Okay. And polls are open at what time? Six a.m. Yay! Love class. <laughs> all right. So after the moderated sessions that Ruby and I will do, we'll also have about thirty minutes or so for audience questions. So you'll see Barbara in the pink NAACP shirt. If you need a card like this to write your question, please do. As you notice, there's no mics going around for questions because we don't need testimonies. So if you have a question, just raise your hand for a card and write it down, and then uh, Larry and I um, will, it will be brought up to us in order to read it from there. Um, questions will be passed to us and at our discretion, so if a uh, question was already asked or anything like that, we're not going to uh, take up time and ask that again. So, let me say this morning as well. You may have already made your choice for DA. That's great. There are people in the room who may have not made their choice.
choice as of yet. So we want people online because we are live streaming as well. Yes, there are people watching um, on our Facebook pages. So we want to make sure that those people who are still deciding have an opportunity to hear directly from the candidates on these very key issues. And so we ask that you not do any outbursts, that you let the process happen. Um, and if you have specific questions, even if it's for a specific candidate, write it down, pass it up, and we'll do our best to include it based upon our time. Is that OK? Yes. yes. Now, how about I need a little more agreement? Yes. Yes. Okay. Yes. yes. All right. Thank you very much. So now, we're going to bring the candidates up. Um, and they are, I think we have uh, all of them, I think all of the candidates. I would just add, I hope the candidates will also be civil to each other and, you know, we hear a little bit about what they're going to do instead of what their opponent. No, let's do the themes before we... Okay. Well, that's, just for those of you who may not be aware, we do have five themes that we're focusing on this evening. And we also want to reiterate this for our online audience. Our themes this evening are going to cover these particular areas. Police brutality and accountability, prosecutorial discretion, implicit bias, restorative justice, and juvenile justice. So hopefully whatever questions you may have that are related to these areas will be asked either by ourselves or will come up throughout the audience questions. But those are the five things we're focused on. We do ask that questions do stay within the realm of those five things. All right, so without any further ado, we're going to bring our candidates up to the stage. They will take the stage before uh, we begin our opening statements. Um, so coming up to the stage in alphabetical order, we have Ama Jamu. 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 Have contact with the criminal justice system. 
I will fight to make sure that we do not rely on incarceration, and I will fight for the vulnerable communities of Brooklyn and beyond. I am looking for your vote on September 12th, and I look forward to your questions this evening. Have a great night. Good evening, everybody. My name is Ama Jamal, and I'm a candidate for Brooklyn District Attorney. I'm running because justice matters, and it matters because it impacts our lives every single day. I went to Barnard College and Columbia University and then Georgetown Law School. Directly from law school, I went right to the Brooklyn DA's office, where I served for over 21 years. During the course of my service, I handled many types of cases. I put rapists and murderers away. But my biggest work, my most noted work, was the work I did when I created the Crimes Against Children Bureau, giving a voice to the voiceless. Four years ago, I was the only one who stood with Ken Thompson, our beloved DA, who became the district attorney because we needed to change. There needed to be a change from the Hines regime. Everyone up here who was running for office supported <coughs> Hines and was with Hines at the time. I now am going to continue his legacy, but there's more that has to be done. One, I'm going to promote the trust. I have to create and build the trust between community and the DA's office. Why? Because a lot of that deals with the wrongful convictions and other things like that coming out of Brooklyn where justice has not been meted out fairly. Number two, I believe in proactive justice, and that's about prevention. We've got to stop talking about incarceration, and we have to stop talking about once people get in the system, we have to start focusing on preventive measures so the community isn't involved. Lastly, if justice matters to you, then vote for Ama Jamo for Brooklyn District Attorney. Because it's time that we make a change. The change is real. It's not just here in Brooklyn, but Brooklyn's the third largest city in America. And you need an advocate, not an administrator, but you need an advocate and a fighter for justice for all people here in Brooklyn. Thank you very much. Good evening, everyone. I'm Patricia Gatlin. Good evening. And Good evening. Good evening. Okay. Thank you, thank you, and I'm delighted to be back here at Major Evans. You know, I t I'll start to tell you a quick story. I'm from Mississippi, and so whenever I see this university here named after Major Evans, who actually came from my hometown in Mississippi, you don't know the pride that I feel here in Brooklyn. Because I have, it, it's, it's just an incredible, incredible thing, you know. My grandfather was a cotton farmer. And here I am running for district attorney here in the county of King. It doesn't get better than that. It just really doesn't get better than other than winning. On <laughs> so, yeah. But this I will say, I've been both a crime fighter and a civil rights person. I have been in both arenas. I was a uh, prosecutor for 15 years. I left as first assistant. And then I went on to be the New York City Human Rights Commissioner for, uh, for 13 years longer than that. But I, I say that to say that the district attorney needs to not only be a crime fighter, but a civil rights crusader. And so I'm going to tell you what I'm not going to do. I'm not going to prosecute people for marijuana offenses. I'm not going to prosecute people for prostitution because I believe that prostitution prostitutes are victims. And I am not going to add, uh, what is it? I'm not going to add um, resisting arrest to disorderly conduct, and I'm not going to prosecute resisting arrest. So that's what I'm not going to do. I am running to restore legitimacy to the criminal justice system. And when I say legitimacy, I mean fairness, integrity, transparency, and equity. So I'm looking forward to answering your questions tonight. And because uh, these issues are issues that I've been grappling with all of my life when we talk about police brutality and bias. I've been there. I've prosecuted those cases. So I want to hear what you have to ask me. And I'm looking forward to it. Thank you very much. How are you? Hey. Oh, didn't mean to interrupt you. Thank you. Yeah. How are you? My name is Mark Fleener. It's Mark with a C. And as I said when I started this campaign, the C is for courage. I want you to remember, because I'm that fifth guy down on the ballot next Tuesday, I want to make sure there's no confusion about this. This is a particular honor tonight because uh, Dr. Reverend um, Barber's life 
has served as a, an example to me as I've sought to seek social justice throughout my career. He, there were a few things that I focused on, not only the fact that he always obviously taught us the, the parallels between um, racial um, discrimination and oppression, but also poverty and oppression. And also because he realized that activism is so often called for when you are trying to change a status quo that is a machine, that's been entrenched, it's been successfully oppressing for generation after generation, and if you're gonna make a change, you've gotta be an activist. And um, the other thing that uh, he and I have in common, if I can be, uh, if I can put myself in that category for a moment, is that we have uh, a relationship right now with a man named Bernie Sanders, who, whose organization, Our Revolution, has recognized that of all the candidates in this particular race, which is of such consequence, not just to Brooklyn and New York City, but I'm gonna say to the nation, is that uh, they're endorsing me. They endorsed me a lot of, with a lot of other grassroots groups, which has given me this extraordinary, youthful, multicultural en 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 energy to be able to proceed. Uh, you'll hear that the reason they've endorsed me is because I am uh, absolutely ready to end what I believe to be a moral uh, broken windows prosecutions um, and, and uh, this cash bail system that is also punishing people for poverty and that I will stop this uh, prison industrial complex from profiting all the lives and futures of those who should be the shining lights of our next generation. So let's get to work. Um, work to uh, uh, help people with justice in our communities. 
And sometimes that host relationship um, can mm, <laughs> rub the community the wrong way. <laughs> so we know that the district attorney's office uh, has a huge impact on the charges that are filed, whether or not charges are filed. They have a huge impact on bail amounts that are requested and if alternatives to justice are suggested and allowed in particular cases. And so this particular area, for those of us who are aware of what's happening across the country, those of us who know what's happening locally, we know that this relationship can sometimes be quite um, traumatic in the way that it, it, the impact is received by the broader community. So we have some questions that will hone in on some of the key structural issues there, and we're looking forward to hearing from our candidates. So as a reminder, the candidates each have one minute to answer these questions, and you, you guys can pay attention to the timekeeper down at the front. So we'll dive right in. Um, Brooklyn NAACP, as long, uh, along with the Center for Law and Social Justice, have been huge supporters of the Right to Know Act in the City Council. Um, and I'd like to know what the what each of the candidates' positions are on the police account accountability bills that have been introduced not only in the city council but also on the state and federal level. And we'll start all down the line um, with Patricia Gavin. <coughs> First of all, accountability is not only important for police, it's tremendously important for prosecutors. And the way I view it is that if we don't, if we don't, look, body cams are gonna add to some accountability, but we also have to have statistical data accountability for police. Meaning, we, know, we have to know who they stop, where they stop, gender, sex, I mean, all of that information has to be data that's not only available for uh, prosecutors, but is available for public. Because by looking at that data, we're also gonna be able to determine where things went wrong, and who's doing, and what's going wrong. I did these kinds of cases when I was in the uh, office to investigate the criminal justice system, and that was the special prosecutor's office, and we found patterns by looking at data. So data is really critical, and if the, uh, if the police department is not gonna keep the data on the police officers and what they're doing, then we have to do it in the prosecutor's office. Because we have to know and understand what they're doing out in the community and how it's impacting negatively. Thank you. And you can stay seated if you want to. I support the Right to Know Act. I support legislation that allows to, the people that are stopped by the police to know who they're getting stopped by, why they're getting stopped, what the circumstances of the stop. Because if we don't know, we can't possibly move to a position of mistrust, to a position of trust and confidence in our system. We need to know um, more about our relationships with the police. We need to know where people are getting stopped. We need to know the neighborhoods that they're getting stopped. If we take a policy and change a policy, we have to know what the policy, what existed before, what exists during, and what exists afterwards. For example, if we change a marijuana policy, we need to know where the people were getting arrested for marijuana before we change the policy, in the, during the part time we're changing the policy, and afterwards, because if we end up with smoking marijuana cases only getting arrested in Brownsville, in East New York, that doesn't inspire confidence in the criminal justice system. It doesn't inspire the confidence with our, our people that are our neighbors and our friends, and certainly doesn't tell us the right that we have to know. And just, for, just for the candidates, you can remain seated if you want to just pass the mic. <laughs> so good evening, everyone. Uh, pleasure to be here, Eric Gonzalez. Sorry for being a little late. I'm, the question is about accountability. And so it's very clear that we need to have much more accountability. One of the things that we discovered when uh, we were looking at the summons warrant issue in New York City was that these summons warrants, uh, and people who got ticket, tickets, there was no identifying uh, criteria on the face of the ticket. It did not indicate where someone came from, um, what the race of the person was, and so when we were looking at these cases, um, we had to kind of go back and make it out. So what I did is we went with um, Ken Thompson, we went over to our summons court, which was unfortunately all the way in Manhattan. And we saw what we expected to see. It was mostly black and you know, people sitting there. Um, these are the kind of reforms that need to be made, not only in the police department, but also in the DA's office. Because you'd be surprised 
to know that our data systems in the office did not even indicate the race of a person uh, when we were pulling it through. You only could do that by looking at the arrest reports and pulling files. So it's one of the things that we need to make do a better job in to make sure that we can answer these questions of accountability, we can answer the questions of racial bias by having the tools necessary. And so that's one of the things that I'm building into the office currently, um, to have the systems in place so that we can take a look at racial disparities, which obviously I'm very concerned about and I'm committed to changing. I support the right to know. This is critical because we have to empower our community and what it means to trust law enforcement. Law enforcement can't be afraid for the community to know who they are and get the information that, that is provided. But one of the most important things when I think about accountability it is the importance of creating an independent commission to review the conduct of the lawyers and the, the NYPD who are involved in the wrongfully convicted cases. It's wonderful, this is the first step, this is, this is really critical because we have to build the trust. People have to know what exactly happened. It's not good enough that people are just exonerated, but we have to dig deep and be prepared and not fear looking at the work of the prosecutors, those who were prosecutors, and the cops that were involved. Because justice demands that. It is important that everyone is treated fairly and evenly across the system, even prosecutors. Absolutely. The, the passing of the right to know is an imperative. Uh, as the chief of the Civil Rights Bureau of the Brooklyn DA's office, I watched countless videos where I saw the interactions between young people of color, particularly young men of color, and the police. And there were some things that were cultural problems, norms that have got to change. The young people did not know their rights, did not know what they had the right to ask in order to empower themselves to be safe and sound. But you know what else? I watched over and over. Police offended and agitated because people were asserting their rights to understand what somebody's shield number was, to understand the fact that they had the right to refuse to ask, answer certain questions, so that the right to know is going to change not only the culture within our young people, but the culture within the police department, and that is a change that is long overdue. I do want to say that the accountability on how we're doing internally in an office on, on, on disparate treatment has got to be transparent. Quarterly, I'm going to provide a report, so we report to you as the public on how we're doing with different, uh, different treatment with those who are from different races. And I'm going to provide an annual report to not only tell you how we did that year, but to tell you what we did inside the office to change the way these things work. There, is a, there are a lot of questions as it pertains to the policies that various municipalities employ for body-borne police cameras. If elected, will you support immediate public access to videos from police sworn or police vehicle cameras in the cases of civilian injury or death at the hands of police? We'll start this way. And just um, all right. Absolutely. We have the, the public, the community has to be armed with the information. By being armed with the information, you are actually holding everyone accountable who's a part of the system. We can't be afraid of that. And by able, being able to do that, we're going to actually have better members of law enforcement doing their best job because why? Because it is being documented and monitored. We must do that, because remember, at the end of the day, when the community, that's each and every one of you, trusts and believe that law enforcement and the district attorney's office are doing the right thing, we are going to be able to work together, and we're going to have a fair system, because that's the goal. Because in the end, justice must matter to you, as it matters to the members of law enforcement, as all of us. Thank you. Yes. Transparency is one of the critical things that has got to change. The fundamental distrust that uh, our young people have, in particular our young people of color, in the system, and the system includes not just the NYPD, but how they feel about the DA's office, is that they don't know what's going on. They're waiting for the release of things. 
I worked with a man named Nicholas Haywood Jr. For ad who asked for information about what happened to his son when he was killed years and years ago. He had to make a Freedom of Information Act request, and what he got was black lines with no information. These are the fundamental problems with the way we deal with folks like that that cause people to say, the system doesn't work for me, and I'm not going to work with them. And that means that we have less safety on the streets when we need to solve violent crimes and less power for the young people who want to grow up safely in that environment. Yeah. So I support body worn cameras. I think it's an important tool in accountability. I have a few caveats with it. First and foremost, we must respect the privacy rights of people who are being videoed, right? Because we say we want public access to it, we're catching people at the worst moments of their lives often. And I think there has to be a, an appropriate balance between the public's right to know about these encounters and protecting all of your civil rights and, and privacy rights. So I think there's something to be thought about carefully there. The other thing is, as we're doing these investigations, we want to make sure that no one is tampered with by having seen the video table to conform testimony. So I think there has to be some sort of cooling off period before these tapes are released, at least until the investigation has spoken to witnesses. But I am a fan of the body cams. I do understand the privacy concerns, and I think they're valid, because if someone comes to your house, an officer comes to your house, you're a domestic violence victim, you've called the police, and that's being filmed, um, while I ex expect, and I do believe that the public has a right to know, you also have a privacy right in your home. So that is a balance that I need to strike as the district attorney. Thank you. I'm a huge supporter of body cameras, body-worn cameras, and I'm a huge supporter of the ability for the police not to turn it on and off at will. That's not it has to begin at the beginning of the interaction, and it has to end at the end of the interaction. And this is part of a larger issue in criminal justice, and I only have a minute to talk about it, and that's called discovery. What information the defendant and the defense attorney have about their case? How much information they have? How complete is it? How early do they get it? Because they need to make a decision about their case. They have to make a decision, do I go to trial or do I take a plea offer? They can only talk to their lawyers and their lawyers can only talk to them if they have complete information, they have honest information, and they have information quickly. So this goes to a bigger issue of discovery reform, but I do support body-worn cameras and I do, do the earliest possible release of that information, especially to the public. We don't want to in Brooklyn what happens in Chicago. <laughs> I absolutely, of course, support body cams, but I also support releasing the videos immediately because, you know, things happen. Technology is not, you know, technology can be altered, and I would rather it be out there when it, when it happened. But also, I think it's important to train the community. I think that we need to go around in the community and talk about what body cams what that means, what's going to happen, and, and so people will understand that it may or may not necessarily mean that you know what you see happen is what's going to translate in terms of what the charges are going to be against the individual. You know, they are not necessarily the the ultimate in making sure that police are going to be policing fairly and justly. It's a tool, and you have to remember that it's a tool, and it's an important tool, and we need to have it here in Brooklyn in the city and we need to use it, and I think people need to understand what that tool can do, what it means, and what it doesn't mean, and, and, uh, and fully explain and fully operate. Thank you. So, at, at this time, you keep up there with me. <laughs> um, so, this is an important question, and the uh, issue of NYPD body-worn cameras is a very important issue, and something that Brooklyn NAACP has been tracking since the introduction of the issue, our Criminal Justice Committee has submitted testimony. Our Criminal Justice Committee has also submitted uh, suggested policy on body-worn cameras. And um, interestingly enough, we never get a response. Um, but we are having a forum for the public on September 28th at um, Emmanuel Baptist Church. There are flyers in the back. 
um, to learn more about this policy because it's already happening. Um, and the NYPD is not doing the best practices that we've already known from across the country. So it's really important that you come out and hear more about that issue. And the same way this room is filled now, we need the room to be filled then so that the continuing education about these issues and how they impact our community on a day-to-day -day basis, making sure that we're there to speak truth to power. So we're going to move on to our next section, which is on prosecut prosecutorial discretion. See, I'm not a lawyer. She is. Okay. <laughs> but before we go, um, we, we start this section and we have a number of questions um, about this section. There, you know, I want to honor the spirit of the families that are in this room already um, who are consistent, you know, continuing the fight to seek justice and hold up their family members' names. I know the family of Akai Gurley is here. I also know um, that uh, the family of Sean Williams is here. And I just want to say um, from Brooklyn NAACP and from Center for Law and Social Justice, thank you for submitting the facts. <laughs> some of these areas um, in, as you, as you uh, should you be successful on Tuesday. First question, in your prosecutorial discretion, will you continue the no charge policy on low quantity marijuana possession? That's a, just a yes or no question. Yep, just yes or no. I will continue. I, I will expand. <laughs> I will continue. I will expand. I'm not charging marijuana cases. Next question. Do you intend to continue the work of the Conviction Review Unit in the Brooklyn DA's office? Without a doubt in expanding it to create an independent commission that is going to review the conduct of the lawyers involved <laughs> as well as members of law enforcement. Right. Absolutely. Work has to continue. It can't continue in that office because there are conflicts of interest that are compromising the decisions that are being made. The work must continue. It's the national model, and we must get to the bottom of each of these cases and free every man and woman who's been wrongfully convicted. I will expand the work of the conviction real integrity unit, and I will also get it right the first time, so in an effort to better <laughs> Not only will I expand it, I think that the conviction review unit needs to have community members on it. And I think that we can have people who have been convicted wrongfully on that panel. Yeah. You know, that's the only way to keep all of us honest. Yeah. And you need to rotate community members, even uh, people from the NAACP and who represent different organizations. They should be rotated on that. And we should report to you what we're doing, how detailed what the investigations are, what's happening with the investigations, and what we're doing, and where we're going. And that should be an ongoing reporting mechanism to the community. But the community needs to be involved with this process. your commitment to that policy, and now, how do you hold attorneys accountable in the office should they violate the accountability? I expect you to take the full minute on this one. <laughs> uh, it's going to be hard for me to reduce the two of you. Oh, I'm sorry. Oh, yeah, yes, on this end. Oh, I'm sorry. Yeah, I'm sorry. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. Patricia, start, please. You see, we're all very cordial here. No, because I'm very passionate about this. And that's about creating a prosecutor's integrity unit. 
not just one person, but a unit. And that unit would not only be comprised of lawyers in the office, but defense and other lawyers from outside of the office who would help us monitor what's going on. It would be an auditing unit, and that unit would not only audit the cases, constantly audit, but they would set up the ethics protocols and the ethics penalties. Because you can't have a protocol unless you have a penalty. And there, and there, is, there are people that um, do things incorrectly, make a mistake, and there are people who intentionally make mistakes and we've got to be able to discern but the only way to do that is to monitor those 400 lawyers i mean we hope that we hire well but you know what you're going to make sure you hire well and you got to monitor them the first thing i would do is make sure that nobody who engaged in a wrongful conviction in my office stayed in that office they would not be there as a in the office do not think we condone that behavior. Second of all, if they engaged in criminal conduct, it would be referred to the appropriate criminal authorities. If they engaged in unethical conduct, it would be referred to the grievance committee of the Bar Association so that they would be in danger of losing their law license if they were found guilty of engaging unethical behavior. If it was a mistake, and it was a mistake that's attributable to training, we would figure out what's wrong with the training, make sure that they're supported, make sure that everybody in the office uses it as a pedagogical tool so that it doesn't happen again. Because we must hold our own attorneys accountable, we must tell the world that those attorneys are accountable, and we must have an open door to the outside world, to the defense attorneys, to the advocacy community, so that when they have information about unethical conduct, when they have information about wrongful convictions, when somebody's innocent, that there is at the top, to me, that information that it can be dealt with in a very efficient and timely manner. Not go through a chain of command which takes five, six, seven months to finally get to the top and maybe somebody looks at the case. So I'll tell you what we've done in Brooklyn uh, which is new, was not there before. We actually have hired an outside retired judge who serves as a ethics consultant. That consultant is there for several purposes. One of the reasons they're there is when a young assistant district attorney has a ethical dilemma. Maybe they disagree with some decision that a supervisor has made. Maybe they just have an ethics question that they want to bring to an independent person who's not part of it direct command chain. So we've, we've instilled that, and that's sort of what Pat has been talking about. I think that Pat is on to a good idea here in expanding that process so that we have more than a single person as part of that. But in Brooklyn, we do have a person that is responsible for looking at these things, and when there is uh, misconduct, now we've already indicated this intentional misconduct and maybe unintentional misconduct, but the consequences for the wrongfully accused are the same, whether it's intentional or if it's uh, negligent. People have been wrongfully convicted, people have uh, lost liberty. And so we have to make sure that those things are investigated appropriately and the referrals are made both to grievance committees and when appropriate to other law enforcement authorities. And that's what I've done in the DA's office in Brooklyn. And I think, Pat, I do agree with you that we should expand it to have more than just a single uh, counselor. Yeah, I have to kind of uh, agree with my colleagues on the other end, uh, Pat and Ann, in terms of the fact that the model that is used has got to be completely different than the model that takes place now. I indicated to you earlier that it needs to be independent because of the potential for conflict of interest inside. It has to include people whose lives were impacted by wrongful convictions. It also has to include people in the defense bar. Um, but, and I, I would say the Legal Aid Society people, the people that serve those that, that, uh, that are, are point of point attorneys because they see these things on a day-to-day -day basis. Um, but the answer to what needs to happen is that independent group needs to make a powerful, forceful recommendation um, uh, and, and uh, say this will be the ethical reports and this will be the consequences you will immediately fire this person. That's critical because right now under the circumstances as they exist, there are folks that are there that have been involved with some of the wrongful convictions that still work there, and there's not been accountability. The only way that's going to change is if an independent investigation takes place. This is, this is why I talk about the creation 
of an independent commission to review the conduct of the lawyers and those that are involved. You see, you have a conviction review unit that's actually looking at these cases, which is important. It has to be built out far more. Okay, so we need to expand that. But we need to have a different set of eyes. Once they made a determination that a person has been wrongfully convicted and they will be exonerated, we need to have a different set of eyes, an independent set of eyes of people. They're going to include community, but they're also going to include a criminal justice experts, separate and apart from the district attorney's office, who can actually review the conduct of the lawyers and law enforcement that are involved. And when it's warranted, they will make, well, first of all, they will make the recommendation as to what the next steps are. So if it is prosecution or referral to the grievance committee, that's when it's done. But what's critical here is that you can't have the same body looking at that same case because we just don't want to get lulled in to just thinking, oh, yeah, this is it. We need fresh eyes and we need fresh perspective and hold everybody accountable. So to date, after 23 wrongful convictions, 21 of them being people, men of color, black and Latino, to date, not one person has been held accountable. Not one person in the district attorney's office or in law enforcement. And that's a problem, especially when you have a detective who's actually been identified in numerous cases has been, that has warranted that an investigation be done. What people will say is that the statute of limitations has run, but the statute of limitations may have run on some situations, but there are cases where that statute is still ticking. And the longer you wait, and the longer you don't do anything, then you're actually not doing justice on behalf of all people. So it's important that the community knows at a base minimum what happened, who was involved, what did they do, and then we can really start holding the system, beginning with the district attorney's office, beginning with the prosecutors, hold them accountable, and then we can start learning really where people go wrong. This is critical. This is the most essential piece when it comes to the truth and trust of the criminal justice system. Because I believe, and I have to say, I'm taking a risk here, but I believe that every prosecutor here they went into this business to do justice. I know I did. In order to do justice, we have to ensure that the prosecutors that are involved in these cases are held accountable. We are all aware, oops, sorry, no. we are all aware of instances uh, where in our local jails and our local prisons, Many of the incarcerated individuals who are there are actually dealing and battling with severe mental health issues. In your capacity, should you win on Tuesday, how will you increase the use of alternatives to incarceration, such as diversion programs to mental health or drug treatment programs? Did we start in the middle? Yep. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Um, you know, I, I was the person who created the Mental Health Court in Brooklyn. I was the person who created the TAN program, Treatment Alternatives for Duly Diagnosed Defendants. Those are the people with mental, a co-occurring mental health disorder and also a substance abuse disorder. I'm the person who created a person in arraignments to detect people with mental health issues that would not stay in the criminal justice system but give them access to mental health services and not keep them in the criminal justice system just because they have mental health services longer than they would ordinarily be there. It was difficult work because we know we have a fractured mental health system here in New York City. It's very, very difficult to negotiate. And what do you think? Because if you wait for the perfect, you never do the good. To do the good, we put got social workers, we got case managers to case manage around our faulty residential treatment, around our faulty housing treatment for mentally ill people. We got NAMI, the National Alliance for the Mentally Ill, involved. We got consumers of mental health services, Howie the Harp and other places. These are all the partners I've already dealt with. There's so much more that needs to be done in mental health and criminal justice. I'm committed to doing it for all of us, for our children, and for the betterment of Brooklyn. We must make sure that these cases don't enter the criminal justice system in the first place. There's a, a litany of cases that come in because there are no other available options. And one of the things that 
you know, the mayor has tried to do throughout New York City and uh, his other uh, programs is to make sure that we have more access to mental health programs. I can tell you that we see many people come into the system um, and then they go to Rikers and they further decompensate there and cases get uh, play language. So what we need to do is make sure that we have community-based responses to mental health issues. We have to take many of these cases and just divert them out of the system in the first place. The police department makes an arrest and then the question is what's the next step? And I believe that we treat certain types of cases pre-charge uh, diversion. Many of these mental health cases need to be treated in the same way. Send them directly to the hospitals and not have them enter the court system in the first place. So I'm going to work very carefully with community-based organizations and mental health professionals who know how to get this work done. I've said this in context to the drug problem that we have, that we've treated drugs as a criminal issue, um, and we should treat it as a health issue. Clearly, the mental health issue must be treated as a health issue and not as a criminal prosecution. which I'm coming from a real different place than my colleagues on the table. Anne mentioned um, what we do at arraignments, and Eric mentioned how people decompensate. I don't understand why politicians work, use words like decompensate, but harm is what we're talking about. Now, here's the deal. The moment that somebody comes into the system and they are charged in a criminal complaint and they have to go to criminal court, even though they are suffering from a mental illness, they are stigmatized and the harm begins. I am going to have pre-arraignment in the hours before a police officer brings them into custody in cuffs, a social services person working with senior experienced ADAs who know what my standards are to say, what drove that criminal conduct? If it was mental health, we will divert them from the system immediately with partners who are ready to do that before arraignment. Do you know what happens at arraignment? A bail is set that keeps them in there that where they suffer more and they hurt and they hurt. I had a client who sat in jail with mental illness for months because the DA's office was attempting to get him to take a felony when he was not prepared to do that. He suffered day in and day out. And folks, I watched him. I went to visit him and I watched him get further and further away from any semblance of health and future. And by the time he took that plea to the felony that they demanded, and I'm going to say in all fairness, that was a different county. So I want to be clear about that. But the point is, it's happening everywhere. But by the time he got to take that felony plea, this was a person that I and the family had to work doggedly with for months and months to repair the damage that was done by our criminal justice system. Mental health is a real issue in our communities, okay? And it's often underreported. So I believe, this is when I talk about proactive justice, I talk about prevention. You see, I think we can all agree that when we enter into the criminal justice system as a victim or a defendant and accused, we've already lost. So the goal has to be, how do we stop this from happening? And that means, having programs, having prevention, focusing on the issues and the needs of the community before they enter into the criminal justice system. You see, it shouldn't be the first time when you're in Rikers Island that you get treatment for mental health. See, we've got it wrong. So it is critical. And then, at the time, now, of those cases, we come in because through prevention, we still didn't catch what we needed to catch through our community partnerships, working with everybody, then that means once it enters into the DA's office, pre-arraignment, I am going to have seasoned prosecutors who are going to review those cases, hand in hand with social workers. Because you see, that's the discretion that the DA actually has, which cases are going to go forward. And we know that you cannot be treated for mental health or drug addiction while sitting in Rikers. Meaningful treatment means that we need to catch this before people enter into the criminal justice system. So I am, um, yeah. oh, thank you, I'm sorry, thank you. Well, that's it. Yeah. I will just say there are, and like what the acting DA said, there are actually other alternatives. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Now, there are two things I, I propose to do. The first thing I'm going to do when I'm elected is go to 
through Rikers and get the people off of Rikers who have mental health, who have mental health issues because they're languishing and they're hurting now. And we need to revisit those cases and reinvestigate and look at those files and pull them out and find alternatives to leaving them at Rikers until we can find out what their dispositions are. The second thing to do, I, want, I propose to do, is to have a permanent mental health committee at the district attorney's office. And that committee would be comprised of people who know a lot more than I do about the diseases and what we need to do and how we need to identify it. And the third thing I propose is that we have to identify young people in schools who we know are struggling and have mental health issues and work with them in, their, in schools with different programs because we know a lot of our juveniles have problems that were never diagnosed or parents weren't able to really cope with or do, where to even go and get services. And so while you know we're not in sort of the business of creating services, we are in the business of creating connections and making sure, because that's the best part of being the district attorney, you have a bully pulpit, and you use that bully pulpit in ways that impact our community positively and with people with mental health issues. Thank you. So I just want to say thank you to the candidates for um, largely keeping to the time. <laughs> so thank you very much. I assume that you have lots of practice as um, at this late stage in the campaign. Um, for those of you, um, you guys are asking great questions that, as you see, we're incorporating into the discussion. Um, if you have any questions, um, we're going to move on to our next section. But if you have any other questions, please um, raise your hand and get an index card. And just to let you know, just because we're going through the sessions here, we still have time at the end for other questions. So as you're passing them up, um, we'll determine um, what we have time for to ask additional questions on a, a different issues. We do, however, ask that you write as legibly as possible. <laughs> I can't read, so we don't hear questions. It's good for you, it's good for us. Okay, so we're moving on now to implicit bias. This is a... Um, you know, really complicated thing. Yes. People, it's so hard for people to think about. Complicated but simple. I mean, oh, we know this okay, the concept of implicit bias speaks to the unconscious bias and stereotypes that can cloud our decision making. Implicit bias in the judicial system is rampant. And so we want to focus on how the candidates will use their position to ensure that communities of color are protected from this form of institutional racial injustice and talk about what specific policies, trainings, that they'll implement in their office to address implicit bias. Um, I guess first they have to agree that it exists. Yes. Um, and then how you will hold the prosecutors in your office accountable. Right. So for our first question, how do you think that implicit, implicit bias shows up in the assistant district attorney's role? For example, during charging, arraignment, bail requests, plea bargaining, trial conduct, or sentencing recommendations. And we're going to start with Anne, Patricia, Mark, Eric, and then Alma. And I just got to know to repeat the question for our online audience. Again, the question is, how do you think implicit bias shows up in the district attorney's role? For example, during the charging, arraignment, bail requests, plea bargaining, trial conduct, or sentencing recommendations. Well, I've already actually done something about this because I teach a law school class and I have a whole segment on implicit bias. And the first thing I make them to do is take the Harvard test, which I've actually tweeted about. If you look at my Twitter feed, the Harvard test is listed there, which tests many areas of implicit bias, not only racial bias, but we have implicit biases about a lot of things. So I don't think it should be anecdotal, actually, about where that bias exists in the DA's office. I think we need to have a statistical review. There's a whole book written about this called Locked In. I've already spoken to its author, John Pfaff, about what kind of data I would have to keep as the district attorney to see where the junctures, where the um, points of uh, decision making for the attorneys in the office, charging, bail, discovery, offer of plea, trial, sentence requests, all of those junctures of discretion, how race affects it, how gender affects it, how experience affects it, to know where the problems are so that I create the solutions. As I said in the beginning, I have a problem-solving agenda. If we don't name the problem clearly, we will never solve it. So I'm not gonna, this is not an anecdotal what I think because I've been in, in criminal justice for 37 years. This is gonna be a statistical analysis based on all of the factors that go into decision making so that I know the biases of my staff so that I can solve the problem. Well, I've been a black prosecutor all for about 15 years. 
15 years, okay? So I know the implicit bias. I understand it. And what we determine, and we know for a fact that if an office is not diverse, that it will get worse. And that you need diversity in a prosecutor's office, and that's what I set out to do in 1999 when we diversified that office from 5 to 52% was because if people aren't, of color aren't there at those junctures that Ann talked about, then you will have bias in those decision-making processes. Now, people talk about all the training, and we've done implicit bias training, and that's a start. But what we really need to do is, again, like they say, go back to the data and go back to the book. For instance, driving while black. I trained 3,000 while black because they were stopping people in certain neighborhoods with certain kinds of cars. And what we found out from that, different kinds of areas, and we have to insist upon it, and we're going to dismiss the cases, and that's going to send the message. And if, for instance, even in Las Vegas now, they've had implicit bias training, and what all got to stop here? I'll tell you the Vegas story. All right. All right. <laughs> um, it doesn't work to tell you I don't have a Vegas story, but I, um, I happen to be a proud member of the LGBTQ community, where there are groups within that umbrella, specifically trans women of color, who are so demoralized by every interaction they have with the process that they would never go near an office. And um, cultural competence is something that has been completely ignored for multiple generations in the office. Um, and, and, but the statistical analysis that Anne references is something that needs to be done, needs to be transparently provided with you, and then needs to be acted upon. Here's something where I'm talking about things that other people aren't. We keep talking about the assistant district attorneys and how they need to be trained, that they need to address these issues. Every single member of the DA's office staff, which by the way should look like Brooklyn and doesn't, um, with all of its beautiful diversity, um, they, what, what about the, the woman who answers the phone when somebody calls, who happens to be an administrative person? What about the paralegal who is the first person to train, bring them in to get assistance? What about those mental health professionals? Every single member of that staff has got to be trained, has got to be, to be given feedback when they are off base, and yes, if they are dramatically off base and it happens, there have to be consequences in this office who needed to review what was happening in one of these cases, especially these cases that have led itself to wrongful conviction. So I'm going to keep a list. We're going to see how many times certain officers are bringing certain witnesses, the same witnesses, on different cases. You see, oftentimes there's a pattern. When you stop and look, when you see injustice, see, it's not just here and there. It's embedded in what we do. So first of all, regarding your question, and that is, what will I do? I'm going to have a review, and I'm going to have someone, I have my integrity officers all throughout the, the, the district attorney's office who will be responsible for maintaining statistics, reviewing the data, and understanding how that impacts justice. Most important, we won't have someone who's using the same confidential informant or same witness to a homicide in every case. That's a problem, and that's what's happened. Thank you. Yeah. Well, you, talk, you asked about accountability with the police, and I, on the stage, tried a police officer who killed an unarmed black man back in 1989 when it was very difficult to secure a conviction. I secured a conviction. He went to state prison in that case. So I don't know how to do that. But holding him accountable on that level transcends the entire office. You know how many times judges say, I don't believe the officer, there's a hearing, and evidence is obtained, and the evidence is thrown out because the judge says, I don't believe the testimony of that officer. It's the obligation of the DA's office to keep that information, and not only keep it in the Brooklyn DA's office, Keep it and send it all over the city. Because just like other professions, they'll move a police officer from Brooklyn to Manhattan to Queens. So it's not just enough to do that in Brooklyn. So it's not just enough to keep a list of an officer who keeps a bad witness or a witness that repeats. It is so much bigger than that, and we have so much more responsibility to the public and to the justice system to do that and share it with our defense attorney colleagues and share it with the public. Uh, 
good news is that we've started that process. We have a database in the DA's office that is in, including every act where we believe an officer has acted improperly, when the judge has found that a officer has been found not credible, um, when we have assistant DAs who believe an officer has misrepresented or lied to them. And so what happens is that information goes into a data system. When that officer makes an arrest, it flags that that case needs to be brought to the supervisor's attention. And the decision will be made whether or not that case will even be prosecuted because of credibility issues with the officer. And then we do more than that. We refer these cases to IAB, to CCRB, and we continue to um, turn that information over to the court and to defense attorneys. In fact, very recently we had a series of cases where officers were recovering guns. And during the um, recovery of the guns, they kept indicating that they had consent to search. And we found that that pattern um, existed with a very small group of officers that defied the pattern of our experience and what we expect other people to do. And, and actually, the people who were accused were saying that's not true. And what we did is we broke that team up with the police department and we referred that for a further investigation with IAB and CCRP. the candidates um, to remember that not everybody knows what the acronyms stand for. Patricia, no, I thought she was going to say stop means stop. <laughs> but when I was with the office to investigate the criminal justice system, and it was a special prosecutor's office for those of you, because we do speak like everybody knows what we're talking about up here, but that would be the Howard Beach prosecutor, 77 precinct uh, office, uh, corruption cases, and those types of cases. And what we learned then was that you, you follow conduct. You know, when officers, for instance, made a lot of arrests, you know, and, and they were also the ones who also did a lot of, you know, there were a lot of complaints against them. So not only do we have to track the officers that we're working with and the types of complaints and the informants, and I did that in narcotics, and we had 2,300 informants. So we, we were really doing some tracking. But we also have, do have to communicate with other prosecutors' offices. Because the first thing the police department is going to do is try to cover it up. That is going to be the first thing they do, and they're going to cover it up not only on the, uh, you know, in the in the computer. They're going to move them. They're going to move them to Staten Island, or they're going to move them to another unit. And then we have to start all over again. And the problem was is that homicide didn't communicate necessarily with the narcotics in the office internally, and they didn't necessarily communicate with other zones. So, for instance, if in narcotics I had an informant, it may have been a hom oops, stop me and stop, it may have been homicide, but communication internally is key. The assistant district attorneys have to know what's going on with these officers. Thank you, stop me stop. I'm going to go last on this one because I am the bottom line when it comes to police accountability. That is what has driven me since the moment that I decided to enter this race. I prosecuted the officer who killed a guy girlie. I prosecuted the officer who stomped on the head of an estranged and unarmed man successfully at a time when nobody else was doing it. I have great respect for what Ann did in 1989, but I'm doing it now. I'm walking the walk now, and I assure you that when we, when we <laughs> disclose, when we find out that police officers are engaging in patterns of credibility issues, of lying, of not reporting, of fudging the facts. I will be the man who is stepping up to the plate to say it's gotta stop. What I wanna know about this database that we're talking about is when do people get to access it? Because remember what I talked about before? Remember what I talked about before? I'm gonna be dealing with things right when people come in with their handcuffs. If we don't catch it then, if we don't know the police officer that's making an incredible statement then, has done it 10 times before, then that whole process that stigmatizes somebody goes into effect and there is no turning back. It has got to be available to the social services person and to the DA the minute that this person comes into the system. And that is my vow, that is my vow, along with many others yeah. relative to police accountability. Shout out to the girl again. hand raise or a yes or no question. We see different lists that elected officials do. Like I, I think there's a list on um, bad um, 
uh, landlords. There's a list for bad landlords that's published and other things like that. Um, in terms of access, Brooklyn NAACP would certainly be interested in this access of identifying repeat uh, behavior from law enforcement. Um, is this something that in if you are elected on Tuesday, you would make public to the community in some way? We can talk about the details of it later, but I just need a yes or no of it being available to the public for review. Yes. Yes, transparency means public trust. Yes, the answer is yes. Uh, the answer is yes, but the caveat that we have to make sure that there that there's a full explanation. Could we put in cases where there's okay. similar matters okay. as well? Thank you. The answer is yes. It goes to the defense attorneys, it goes to the public, it goes to everybody who needs to have confidence in the criminal justice system. Thank you. The answer is yes, and it's going to be in multiple languages so that everybody can understand it. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you so much. That concludes our implicit bias segment for this time. We're now going to move on to juvenile justice. Mm. The School to Prison Pipeline is a combination of school-based policies and procedures, such as zero tolerance programs that criminalize minor rules and fractions, that frequently funnel black and brown youth directly into the criminal justice system. We wanted to hear from the candidates about how they would use their position to balance the need to hold young people accountable for crime with the need to reduce the overall overcriminalization of black and brown youth. I, and as Brooklyn NAACP's perspective, and I'm certain um, uh, that the center also agrees with this, when we're talking about accountability for police officers, we know anecdotal cases and issues of them, um, uh, the brutality against adults. But what often goes unheard is the uh, brutality and the disrespect of young people in our communities. Um, quite often I live by a high school, and quite often I am stopping police officers um, from just uh, violating the rights of young people that do not know. And we notice that the rights of the young people that are being violated are specific in the groupings, right? Because we don't see that same violation across all communities. It is specific against black and brown youth. Um, in addition, the category or the labeling of being a gang member is something that is thrown around not only nationally, but here also in the city um, as an, and used as an excuse and weaponized against our young people. Um, and so we, this section is particularly important. We're skipping one section to go straight to this because we want to know um, that the district attorney who's ever elected on Tuesday has the same commitment to protect uh, our young people of color in this borough and to ensure that one minor mistake doesn't follow the rest of them, follow them the rest of their lives, or if they're innocent, period, then it does not follow them the rest of their lives. Um, and so we have a number of questions also from the audience um, on this issue as well, um, in, in addition to the questions um, we have. So we'll start in schools. You know, we mentioned being in a high school and seeing how young people are accosted in school. Um, will you charge young people with school arrest if the principal opposes these charges? And um, we'll start with Mark. Yeah. Well, I just want to make sure that we're clear because I mean, I, I, I have a lot of experience with the, the impact on, um, uh, on youth of being criminalized in their schools, but I, you're saying, what if it were a violent crime? You're saying it's a violent crime potential? No, um, we're, oh, okay. I mean, not even specifically talking about violent crime. It was at a really gang-challenged area in Southern Stone and Brownsdale, and these kids would talk to me day after day after day about the fact that police officers stopped them outside the school, inside the school, and asked them a series of questions that clearly treated them as criminals. That, that behavior has got to stop. It is stigmatizing, and then what it does is it leads to look at a minor offense, let's look for larger offenses, and it begins that school to prison pipeline. So um, the, the key answer to your question is raise the age means that we need to be handling cases in family court, and that's not what the, the district attorney is going to do. But there's still an amount of discretion in terms of what the district attorney does. And in terms of the discretion that I will use as to what's to be prosecuted, I will always take into consideration that a juvenile is a juvenile. They are developing, and they cannot be stigmatized at that stage in their life. And, that, and that's going to be based upon my experience with watching kids 
that were burned by it before they even walked up to their school in the morning. Thank you. Uh, pardon me, you said the question was about in school, right? And if the principal doesn't want to have that happen, right? Have it. Yeah, if the, if how we, so two questions. Okay, One, you. if a principal doesn't want a student to be charged, how would you handle that, right? And then second, how are you going to handle juvenile crimes in your office in general? Thank you. First of all, my concern is that oftentimes the way students and young people are being treated in school it is really like they're in jail. And that's a problem, because we don't want our young people to feel that they're actually going into a system of incarceration. So if the principal says, listen, this is not what we want to do, I'm going to, I'm going to, um, I'm going to uh, uh, take that into consideration, and I probably won't be going forward in those cases. However, what I think is key is I'm going to create a youth advisory council where I'm gonna be working with youth all across the borough. Because what I found out is that, you know, youth speak better to youth. And it's about understanding the discussion and how it is to engage them into the system and what's going on. I have to hear from them, they need to hear from me, but I need to be a part of a conversation with them. Because their lives are impacted each and every day, especially youth of color, each and every day by the criminal justice system, by just merely walking down the street. So in order to do that, we need to have an advisory council who will work hand in hand with me as we move forward in looking at the cases that are impacting our community. We know that if a child is suspended two times in elementary school, they will more than likely end up in the criminal justice system. And we have schools here in Brooklyn that they've already labeled our children because they're in persistently dangerous schools. So they go to the junior high school. You came from the persistently dangerous school and they've labeled our children. So as district attorney, not only do I have to go to elementary schools and work with parents and teachers and administrators, and you know to deal with the sort of over policing in our schools because our children black and brown children are more often than not charged with harsher penalties in school you know a little black girl like me who runs her mouth all the time i'm the one who gets suspended versus somebody else whose child doesn't and so we have to go and work with them to make sure that happens that being said you know we raise the age to 16 i'm going to raise the age to 21 because i think that people, there's young people are still form, forming, you know, their minds and their bodies, and we have to look at them on the continuum. And it just doesn't start at 16 because I wasn't an adult till I was probably about 30. And so, you know, no, you know, and we make mistakes along the way. Fortunately, I lived in places where mistakes didn't mean you went to jail. Mistakes mean you went and you spoke to the parent. And so, we need stronger connections in schools. We need stronger connections with families. And then we need to look at how we're charging and and, and, and having programs. Stop me, stop. I raised two children here in Brooklyn, so I know the challenges of parents. I know what it is to send a child to school and want it to be a place of learning and then not to go there in a place of fear. There are programs around this country that don't rely on law enforcement, that don't rely on the police to resolve disputes. It's called alternative dispute resolution. Experts come into those schools. Experts teach young people how to speak to each other, how to speak to the adults, so that they never ever have to rely on law enforcement. Law enforcement should not have a place in our schools at all. At all, they should not be there. We should live in a place where you don't have to get, go through a metal detector in order to walk into a school, where people can be in a school and be free to learn and speak their minds. Why can't they speak their minds and learn? So I'm committed to doing the things that we need to do. Now, raise the age created some issues because what it does is it sends 16 and 17 year olds in very, very low level cases to family court. Family court is not the answer on low level cases. Sometimes family court incarcerates low level cases more than the criminal courts. We actually have to speak truth about what this issue is. And we have to have programming that allows for those children to have appropriate um, balances about what they need to avoid conduct in the future, and the age of, of development for the brain is 25. So if we expand it from 16 to 17, we should go all the way up to 25.
in Brooklyn, we could not wait for them to raise the age. We had generations of young uh, children coming into the criminal justice system, and we kept doing the same thing to them. They came in, we wanted them to plead guilty to something, and then um, some form of punishment. They either pled to a violation in community service, or probation, or jail. That's not what works, that's not what keeps us safe, that's not what is in the best interest of these young people. We created in Brooklyn a young adult club that goes from 16 to 24. The end part of that is that when they come into the court, they meet with a social worker, a social worker that tries to figure out why they're there in the first place, and then have an individualized mandate that helps service their needs. So if they have a, health, a mental health issue, we get them treatment, a drug addiction issue, we get them treatment, anger management, we get them anger management. I believe that that will keep us all safe by giving these young people the tools they need to be successful. We already gone 16 to 24. We're the only place in New York State that's done it. It's only been done one other place in the country, and we've serviced hundreds of kids. But the most important part of this is at the end, I don't care about the conviction. I care about accountability, and I care about fairness. And at the end, because we know the collateral consequences last forever, so at the end, we'll make sure that there's no criminal convictions. So, so as the NAACP here, um, we believe in having laws on books. That helps. As an attorney, we believe in having good laws on books. Okay. So as, as we close up this section on um, juvenile justice, and we have um, questions for um, time for more questions, I want to know what specific legislation. I know that there, as a district attorney, you have discretion in terms of what policies you have in your office, but you're also an elected official, um, and you also have a bully pulpit to advocate to a city council, to a mayor, to a governor, to an attorney general about having specific laws on the books that help you do your job. Um, because I know some of you have used it to advocate against legislation that we've been fighting for. So I want to know what specific legislation would you advocate for a law on the books when dealing with uh, youth offenders? Something that we're not looking at. Um, looking at. Well, first of all, um, as you know, I was the chief of the Crimes Against Children Bureau, where I focused on bringing a voice to the voices to our children who have been victims of abuse. I was the only candidate who stood before and, and asked, I had a press conference, and I asked that the people come forward and actually support the CVA, the Child Victims Act. And what that translates to is that right now there's a statute of limitations that exists, that if you're over 23, and now you're a victim as a child, and you're now at 23, you don't get your justice because the statute of limitations won't allow it. So I asked for people here to stand with me to really push the CVA. The CVA will allow people to have justice who have been victims of the most horrid abuse. Now remember, not every child can find the way to be able to tell the secret that has actually been a part of their lives. You have to remember now, this is the most horrid secrets that children hold on to. Oftentimes, the abuser is known to them. It's not a stranger. It's either a family member or a teacher or a coach, and they cannot muster the courage for whatever reasons to speak up and speak out. So the CVA is something I feel very strongly about. You see, a lot of people don't like it because it will hold institutions uh, civilly liable for money down the road. But there's no money when, it's, when it comes to justice. Thank you. I don't know what I'm on that too, but I think you want to hear as many ideas as possible. So I'm going to tell you right what I'm going for because it absolutely disproportionately impacts on the young. I want to work with state legislatures to go to Albany and end cash bail in New York State. I want young people who can't get two hundred and fifty dollars bail because their their aunts couldn't raise it or their grandmothers couldn't raise it and they sit in jail before they've been convicted of anything. When we all know, all of us in this room, and certainly all of us on the stage know that there is no correlation between coming up with two hundred and fifty dollars and coming back to court. It is a tax on the poor and overwhelmingly a tax on poor young a tax on poor young people. Now this is something that I feel strongly about because don't forget we can change policies 
And we can say, I'm going to only ask for cash bail in cases where we would ask for jail. That's my policy. But I have to go to the next step. I've got to get on that bully pulpit that I get with this election and go to Albany and say, we are here to tell you that in New York City, in Brooklyn, this is an immoral situation and we need to change it. And I'm going to work with those legislators. I'm going to work on the language. I'm going to work on the lobbying. I'm going to work on everything it takes to get it done. And I don't care how long it takes to get it done. I'm going to get it done. So there's three parts to legislation that I think would be very important for our young people. And we also know that today, in the time that we're living in with the craziness coming from Washington, D.C. and DACA, that these collateral consequences of convictions are so important to young people and their future, not just in uh, now being kept allowed in the country and staying in the country, but in employment, education, and housing. So what I think is, first and foremost, I would support legislation that would increase the age of a youthful offender status. Right now it's from 16 to 18. I believe it should go to 21. I'm also going to be a strong proponent of making sure that we have a real ceiling provision and a real expungement provision in New York State. See, people who commit and make a mistake and commit a crime and pay their dues after a period of time, they should not be wearing the scarlet letter of their mistakes forever and ever. So we need, to, we need to have mechanisms in our system, especially for our young people. Someone who makes a mistake at 20 should not be dealing with that at 35 years old when they can't get a job and trying to support a family. Expungement makes sense. We have a limited sailing provision that has just come into effect in October of this coming year, but we need to do more, and I will push for that. things right now, so I'll talk really quickly about two or three. Number one, it's I agree, we need to end the cash bail system, but that may take years. What do we do today to the person who's standing in court today? I think that we should increase the community bail fund. Right now, our assembly has already passed the $2,000 limit to raise it to $5,000 limit. I will force my the, the IDC and the others in the legislature to look at that for today. So today's defendant doesn't wait for next year or next month or uh, forever to wait for no cash bail, and I will do that. The other thing is, when we talk about raise the age, when we talk about juveniles, the one great thing that the Family Court Act has that we didn't do in raise the age is something that they allow the case not to even enter the system in the first place. That it goes to another agency. The other agency looks to remedial help for you, a young person. Those 16 and 17 year olds that are going to remain in the criminal court, by and large, it's the largest number that they left in the legislation should be able to be, it's called adjusted, meaning that it's not even in the criminal justice system to begin with. There are so many other things that we could do legislatively that we have to work with our partners. I've worked with all these legislators in the past. I've done legislation that helped social workers get their credits at the DA's office because they couldn't get continuing education credit. I've worked with the legislature in the past to make sure that workers get fair share to make sure. Okay, I'm, I'm going to stop and I'm going to talk about it in another question. I would support the legalization of marijuana. I am not going to prosecute marijuana cases, and I think that will have a tremendous impact on our young and black and brown men and those individuals who are non-citizens. I also, because it's going to happen in New Jersey with this new governor, and so why, why shouldn't we do this here in New York? We've been moving towards it. Let's just do it. Let's just get it done. There are also some sex crimes provisions that we need to look at, because oftentimes some of our young men are charged at 16 and 17 and 15 because they've had relationships with younger girls and, and different issues. And so I think we need to, to look at legislation in those areas because I know young men have been strapped since they were 16 years old with sex crimes charges that may or may not, probably should not have been there. And that's preventing them. And um, I've got 30 seconds. What was the other thing? Of course I support no cash bail, but you know what? We don't need legislation to do that. As it pertains to bail reform, if elected, and we want to actually thank Common Cause for submitting this question and for also being a really diligent partner in spreading the word about this event. We love you, Susan. If elected, will you commit to reviewing the cases of everyone in jail who has not posted a bail amount under $1,000? 
And if there are no threats to public safety or a flight risk, will you make a joint motion with the public defender to release that person on their own recognizance as is currently done in Cook County? I feel like that's a yes or no question. I think time of the day. Absolutely. I listened to every part of that, and the answer is yes, 100. So so here's where I'm at on this issue, very quickly. I believe that our bail system needs to factor in dangerousness, and that's more important than risk of flight, and I would support anyone who's in custody currently on a low-level charge on a less than $1,000 bail um, for an immediate review. So that's it? Yes. Okay. Yes, with no qualifications. (laughs) Yes. Thank you. So I want to move on to, um, this is another issue that um, we've been partners on, um, which is deed theft and mortgage fraud in Brooklyn, um, which has significantly impacted uh, communities of color and their source of wealth um, here in Brooklyn. And so I want to know what action uh, will you take regarding mortgage and deed um, fraud in Brooklyn, and how will you prosecute real estate creditors uh, in the county of Kings? So we have an active uh, real estate fraud unit now. Um, almost, if you go onto our website, you can see virtually every other week we're indicting someone for a fraudulent transfer, a deed fraud, um, continuing to take advantage of the people who made Brooklyn great in the first place. It's not lost on me that during the tough times in the 70s and 80s and even the 90s, a lot of people left the city. And the people who stayed and then bought homes and invested in their communities and our seniors are being taken advantage of. And so I'm gonna stand with those folks and make sure they get justice. We're gonna get their homes returned to them. We're gonna continue to fight with them. But we also need to do more because we have to go after the people who are creating that culture. And I'm very proud to tell you that you know, with some of these developers and these real estate people who put working class people in jeopardy yes. by doing these illegal conversions, yes. by doing this illegal development, we're going to hold them responsible. In the last few months, I've indicted two uh, developers who put people in risk. And in fact, in one of the cases, someone lost their life and two other people were severely injured. So that's how we're going to hold them accountable. We have to continue. And this is a tremendous issue in this community. Um, it continues to knock on people's doors, and that should probably be a crime. If you're not, your house is not for sale, so someone shouldn't come to your house knocking on your door. Not only will I investigate the developers and these landlords and people who are buying these buildings and flipping them and then charging phenomenal rents because they held the rent back when they got the rent increases. Yeah. And then all of a sudden, your $1,000 a month rent went to $3,000 or under 2400 But we're also going to create a senior protective unit because the seniors are being, partic- are being hit hard with this. And that unit would consist of not only lawyers and investigators and social workers, but we would basically put seniors under our protection. And they would be uh, listed in our program, and we would put signs on their doors that do not knock on this. If you have, if you want any contact with this senior, you call the district attorney's office. And I think that will kind of stop a lot of what's going on. It's a very simple thing, but we will know because people target their buildings and they do the the lawsuit thing. They, you know, they file three lawsuits, and then the senior doesn't, you know, understand what's going on. And they go to nursing homes or they go to rehab and then they find out they don't have a home when they come back. And so we have got to put them and we're going to go find them where they are and talk to the seniors and talk to their families and place them under our protection with this unit and put signs up that we're watching you. In addition to uh, investigating these community boards and other people who are involved in this corrupt process. all of this in conjunction with our financial institutions and with the web of information that technology provides. Because there are things that are going on that we can detect 
because of where they're happening, which financial institutions show a blind eye to these practices, which, which communities show a blind eye to these practices. And so the information is power, and sharing that information is the most powerful thing you can do. And those financial institutions are around. They are doing already some work in the federal government when it comes to sex and labor trafficking and money laundering. They already are organized and they already are working with law enforcement when we detect a crime, but they are in the ivory towers doing their other thing. There has to be a communication because what's going on in the street and what's going on in those ivory towers are connected. And if we don't talk to them and hold them responsible, shame on us. Okay, here's, here's the challenge on this. Um, I hear what people are saying. I hear that the acting district attorney is talking about this unit that he's got in place. Do yourselves a favor. I, I talk to families all the time that are dealing with what happens with gentrification and the knocks on the door and the splitting up of families. Do yourselves a favor between now and Tuesday. Look at who contributed to the campaigns. I'm talking big amounts of money of the people on this state. Like, for example, if you took a lot of money, which the acting district attorney did, from the gentleman who is creating luxury rentals in the Bedford Armory, oh, 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 what oh, 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 then that person oh, 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 did he get a special pass? Is that a conflict of interest? Come on, folks, who know the answer. Yeah. All right. Yeah. I, I want to be very clear on these attacks. The attacks are, we are prosecuting landlords and real, real estate developers in ways that had never been done in this city, in the Brooklyn DA's office. We've led the way on this. There's a reason why, there's a reason why virtually every um, labor union and trade organization has supported me and has given me their endorsement because I'm not allowing these developers to get away with things. We've brought cases on prevailing wages when they cheat workers. We've brought cases when they cheated people from overtime wages. I will continue to fight the fight for this. People contribute money to the campaign from many segments of society because they believe that Brooklyn needs a DA who's not only going to keep them safe but treat them fairly, and that's what I'm going to do. Thank you. The greatest robbery that's happening in Brooklyn are people's homes are being yes. taken. And that's real. And what makes it even far more intense is that you have people knocking on the door, bringing cash money to our seniors, to people who just really don't understand the absolute wealth that they have. I'm glad that pretty much we are all in agreement in terms of what needs to be done. I am going to have a unit that focuses on protecting our tenants and going after these predatory landlords. But I must say, I agree with I agree with my colleague here, Mark, when he talks about taking money in and who is contributing to your campaign. Because at see, at the end of the day, there's a reason why. So we need to keep truth to power here. Because this happens to our homes. This is all about where people live. And Brooklyn is changing, and we have to ensure that the people here who've had their homes for generations, they're able to keep them. Free of being assaulted, harassed, and being beaten down by these predatory landlords. Um, so I want to thank everyone for submitting questions, and I wish we had time to do all of them, but um, we do not. You saw how many we have. You would be very proud to be sitting next to the Brooklynites in the room. We tried to uh, incorporate them all, so even though we may not have read your specific question, um, hopefully we were able to include it in the section. So we have um, uh, one yes or no and um, two questions, and then we're going to have the candidates um, do their closing statements. So we'll have everyone out of here by 8.30. Um, and so the, first, the, the one I want to ask 
because I'm, I'm actually really upset about this, um, about um, the prices of Metro cards in, in, in things and the, you know, MTA. Um, uh, fix it, Cuomo. All right, so, um, <laughs> it's, not, it's not just the mayor, guys. The governor called his office about fixing the NTA. Um, but um, is the question of fair evasion? I don't know how many of you see the cops or people waiting just behind the turnstile to catch young people or to catch other people. Um, the re I actually see um, that at our train stop, there's a gentleman um, during the summer, he has just got a job and he gets there two hours early to get a swipe in um, in order to go to work because he didn't have the money necessary um, to get a Metro card. And shout out to all of you organizers who are promoting the Swipe a Forward campaign. Um, communities of color have been targeted um, for those arrest and summons that we're talking about for uh, turnstile jumping. Um, and so how uh, will your office uh, deal with these issues? Um, the police say that it helps them catch, you know, people, um, but I don't know any evidence, no strong evidence of that. So how will your uh, office as district attorney address this? And we'll start this way and go down. Bottom line is that we're not going to prosecute. I applaud um, Cy Vance in Manhattan by not prosecuting those cases. It doesn't make sense, especially in communities of color, especially where poor people are. They're trying to get to work. We can do better than that. Why are we going to have people go through the system which we know is a real traumatizing thing to go through, all in the name of trying to get someplace? That makes no sense. Turnstile offenses are part of a long list of low-level, victimless offenses, sometimes referred to as broken windows, that I'm not having. And, and the other thing that I want you to understand is that I'm going to send a, a letter to the police commissioner on day one when I get in to list the offenses to him. So the police officers are taking people into custody and putting them through that first piece of hell because of something that I think is actually like a survival crime. Um, they need to be on notice that I'm not prosecuting it. So do so, sir, respectfully, at your own risk, man. <laughs> So I, I have a very strong support of the Fair Fairs campaign to provide um, swipes and to measure costs to people on, based on the economic issues. So people who had it, um, poverty issues and, and can't afford to pay the, the fare can have um, access to the system. And I think that we have to figure out ways to do that as part of fairness. I used to remember watching kids who were going to school who, uh, and I saw it as a DA as well, didn't have the train pass or the metro card and they got arrested and it was, it was ridiculous. It was ridiculous. It's not just, it's not fair. And, you know, I've been on the record on this for a, a time. This is not something politically expedient. I indicated that I would not prosecute fair evasion cases because I don't think that prosecuting those cases keep us safe. I think the criminal justice system is too big. Um, we take in too many cases. I believe in the law enforcement practice that we're having in Brooklyn, and I think it's why we have record low crime in Brooklyn, is because we focus in on the drivers of crime. So as people come through the system, we're gonna make decisions, and we're not gonna prosecute people who are no threat to public safety. Thank you. This is part of a bigger problem, and the bigger problem is penalizing poverty. We have to stop penalizing poverty. And it's not enough, it is not enough to say that I will not prosecute people who are evading their fares or are jumping the turnstile. And send it to a civil system where if a person can't afford $2.75, can they afford a $100 fine in that civil system? Of course not, of course not. And even though, even though 
know, the law says, well, maybe positively you might be able to do community service. In fact, community service does exist. And what exists every day in our system is they enter a judgment when you can't pay. And when you enter a judgment, it stays with you for seven years. Do we ever expect people to get out of that cycle of being penalized because they're poor if we start that cycle? So no, I won't do fair vision. I won't penalize poor people. But I won't shift it to another system that does penalize poor people. And, and fair vision. My list is growing. Resisting the rest is on that list also. Um, we're going to take that money that, that you know that we would use in prosecuting those kinds of cases, and we're going to go after corruption cases. We're going to go after economic crimes kinds of cases, and stop wasting our money on these kinds of cases that fill our system with individuals who feel like you know because if you get if you get charged. Then you, you know, they start to add up, and the cumulative effect is you end up on Rikers. So we're going to save that money and use it on the real criminals who are really destroying our community. So, Joy, one of the things the Center for Law and Social Justice has long committed to is a permanent special prosecutor in cases of police abuse and brutality that result in injury or the death of uh, civilians. Now, executive orders are great. We know that in the last administration in Washington, the use of executive order was, was strategic and was designed to bridge the gap between changes that were needed and a Congress that wouldn't do it. Um, we now have a special prosecutor via ex executive order here in the state of New York, which again is wonderful, but it's not permanent. Mm -hmm. Will you, in your, should you be successful on Tuesday, will you commit to recommending jail time for police officers whom you successfully prosecute for homicide, manslaughter, or other serious bodily injuries? The answer to your question is absolutely. And I'll take it even a step further. In cases where an officer has discharged their weapon to an unarmed person, I understand that there is that executive order, but that executive order is not always actually exercised. So I will petition before the court for a special prosecutor, because this is about building trust. And what I know is from my experience that as an assistant district attorney, when I would go to a crime scene, I'd go to a precinct to investigate a case, um, civilian versus civilian, I was open, they treated me wonderfully, the police. I was, they had me with open arms. However, everything changes when one of them has discharged their weapon, and that's real. And then you begin to realize that the relationships that you've had with them can, in fact, color how you perceive what exactly has happened. And that's a problem. So I believe that you need to have a special prosecutor, someone who's not involved with the day-to-day -day activities and, and interactions, work experience, with these law, members of law enforcement when this happens. The bottom line is we have to have accountability, transparency, but we gotta build the trust between community and law enforcement. And I would work with any special prosecutor that is legislated, and I'm happy to do so. I think that um, what actually happens now is that the district attorney's office is on the front line when something like this happens, and usually the special prosecutor comes in and they work together. Of course, I would continue to do that. Now, if you ask me, do I support asking for jail or prison with a police officer who's killed somebody? I've already done that. I'm not going to promise you something and then not deliver it. I've already done that. I did that when nobody was doing it in 1989. And Mark and it wasn't old when I did it. It wasn't old, it wasn't easy. And I will say this, it's in a book. It's so unique that it's in a book called Upon This Rock, Miracles of a Black Church. And the reason it's in that book is because Johnny Ray Youngblood, Reverend Youngblood, and his members of his church came to court every single day to support me in my prosecution of that police officer who did serve state prison time. So it's not an empty promise with me. So, as the Chief of Civil Rights, I set up a protocol by which we were able to objectively and fairly investigate these cases and take them as far as we could. And one of them was the Akai Gurley case. And um, I uh, investigated it, and I tried it, along with Mr. Alexis, who's sitting right there, as Eric likes to point out, and I respect that. 
And then there came the time for the sentencing recommendation, and I believed that the officer should be held to the same standard that every single one of us would be held to if we had been convicted of the same offense. And I lost that battle, if you will. I took it as far as I could, and I stepped away, and I assure you, based on everything you've seen about me walking the walk, that I will take it there. I am not pro-police. I am pro, I am not anti-police. I am pro-equal justice. We violated the public trust by not taking that all the way. It sent a terrible message to the community. It's not gonna happen on my watch. It's why I'm here. It's why I'm fighting so hard for all of you right now. You know, Anne forgets that I was in the special prosecutor's office in 1987 and tried police officers and convicted police officers and corrections officers and the judge and lawyers also. And that being said, I believe in that office. And that office, to, it was called the Office to Investigate the Criminal Justice System. It was a completely independent office. And they worked with their own investigators and then investigators throughout the state and different DA's offices and the police department. The problem I have, and I was in uh, Governor Cuomo's office when he did this, when he gave the jurisdiction to uh, Schneiderman, and so I tell people I analogize it to CCRB, which does nothing and is nothing. You know, everybody thinks they're going to resolve something by going to CCRB. It's just not going to happen, okay? I hate to bust your bubble, but it's not going to happen. Because, and, you know, he has to work with the same police officers on the case who are downstate and work with state troopers and investigators and people who don't have a vested interest in our community. When these kinds of cases happen in our community, we should investigate them in our community. We have a right to know what's going on, to look at them, to be there, to come to the court. And unfortunately, when I tried those cases, nobody was in the courtroom but the PBA and uh, the, the other police organizations, and I'd have to walk in there by myself. So I'm hope now we have you know a public that's more interested. I have to stop. But yes, I will continue to do those cases and set up protocols so we go there. I would not advocate the responsibility of investigating and bringing charges when I believe an officer was properly charged. I support the executive order. I think the executive order is important in uh, ensuring trust in the community. And clearly, I will work with the uh, Attorney General of New York State to make sure that these cases are fully investigated. But I believe, and we've shown in Brooklyn, that we can do these cases. We've shown it because we actually did do something that had not been done in over 10 years, which was in New York City. We had indicted an officer um, in the grand jury, brought him to trial, had him found uh, guilty, and he was convicted. Now, we, and, and to the Akai Gurley family, you know, no words that I can say or any of us in here can say could ever bring back the loss that you suffered. But we are very clear that you know, having a district attorney is about having someone in the system who has to make difficult decisions. And I will say that I know that decision that Ken made in this case was an unpopular decision. It's something that the community felt that did not um, reflect the values that many of the people here have. But I will tell you, having been there in the room with him, along with Joe Alexis, along with Mark Fleener and others, who were part of that trial, that he believed in his decision making in that case. Um, he prayed on it, and you know what you want from your district attorney is a Thank person you. who will stand up and at least squarely look you in the eye and tell you why he did Thank it, you. and that's what he did. Thank you. And I want to thank you, audience, for um, uh, participating by sending questions and also adhering to the ground rules. We'll give you a round of applause. Let's take a look around this room and see how representative it is of Central Brooklyn. And I think that is one of our biggest Now, as a reminder, each of the candidates here have an opportunity for a closing. They're closing, they have three minutes. Um, as we uh, stated earlier, there were numbers picked out of the hat in terms of order. Um, and so we'll uh, 
they did that going here and we'll do the reverse, I guess, uh, closing. Um, so we'll start with uh, Eric Gonzalez. I became a prosecutor for a very simple reason. I wanted to make my community a better community, a safer community, and I wanted fairness. And for those who don't know my personal story, you know, I grew up in East New York in the 80s and 90s. I lived there during the height of the crack cocaine epidemic, and I lived there when people called my neighborhood the murder capital of the city. I became a prosecutor because I saw not only the people who were injured, and the people who were victims of crimes, but I also saw the unyielding uh, nature of our criminal justice system. See, I grew up with friends who got in trouble, got involved with drugs, and the criminal justice system never gave them a second chance. They had those convictions for the rest of their lives. And when I'm home in the community, these people who are now in their 40s, like I am, have never been able to recover from that. I made a decision at that early age that I was gonna try something different because we all know that most black and Latino lawyers wanna become defense attorneys and not prosecutors because we think that, you know, prosecutors are always harmful to our community. Very rarely do we believe that prosecutors are, have the best interest of our community at heart. I made the decision that if I was given an opportunity as a prosecutor, not only would I help keep us safe, but I would make sure our criminal justice system worked for us. In 2013, I was given an incredible opportunity after all of you helped elect Ken Thompson. See, I had been a prosecutor for about 18 years and had gained a lot of experience about what worked and what did not work in our criminal justice system. But I also knew that I could help Ken uh, figure out how we can continue to keep Brooklyn safe, um, drive down crime, but also have fundamental fairness in our criminal justice system. And that's something that we did together for me helping him establish our conviction review unit, for me working on the marijuana reform and the, the non-prosecution of global cases, and ultimately declaring these summons warrants. In the 10 months or the 11 months now that I've been the DA of Brooklyn after Ken has passed, I've continued to keep us safe by bringing cases that matter, gun prosecutions, bringing down gangs, who are targeting and shooting people, but not wide sweeps, very focused cases. And I continue to fight against Donald Trump and the policies that are wrong head headed. And that includes going back the wrong way on drug cases and mandatory minimums and treating drug addiction as a criminal response. I'm gonna treat it as a health issue. I'm gonna protect immigrants and non-citizens in this community. I'm gonna stand up to these policies. And you've seen that here, I've created a Young adult court have created an immigration affairs unit that will be the national model how we keep our non citizens safe and treat them fairly. They ask you to vote for me and continue to give me the trust that you gave Ken and me as we were changing this office. This office Thank is you. so much better today than it was years ago. Thank you. If you don't want change, don't vote for me Tuesday. If you think good enough is good enough, don't vote for me Tuesday. If, however, you think that there is a moral imperative to once and for all, after generations and generations, in the place we can do it, in the time we can do it, to actually address reforms that will change a system that was designed to oppress and successfully done it, then I am your guy. You know, uh, five borough defendants uh, gave us all a scorecard. And, I, and I'm very proud of the fact that I came up on top in terms of my commitment to end mass incarceration and all of these things because I never understood why ADAs and public defenders go into their separate corners right off the bat in the criminal court when all we're supposed to be doing, all of us, is achieving constructive and equal justice. I'm proud of that scorecard. And I want you to look at it on Tuesday. Here's the deal, here's the deal. I had a conversation recently with a young man who came here from Trinidad. Uh, and he said to me, well, I grew up in Trinidad and, and I watched Sesame Street. And 
the Muppets and all the characters taught me in their little sketches that the police were there to, to help you and protect you. And the process of me moving to New York City and living in New York City has, a process, has been a process of unlearning that. Man, that anecdote broke my heart. If that's where we're at, and it is where we're at, that where people are so disenfranchised from the system, the criminal justice system, that they think they shouldn't access it from the outset, there is time, to, this is the time to make a difference. So as far as I'm concerned, it's a moral imperative. That's all I've got to say to you. Um, and I think that I come at it from the same place that some of the giants that, that, that founded the NAACP took. And, and here's, here's the deal. Frederick Douglass said, and I say it to my campaign staff all the time, power never conceded without a demand. Tuesday, your vote. It's real simple. That's your demand. If you want true systemic change, I am your choice for Brooklyn District Attorney. A 70-year-old black man went into the voting booth to vote for the first time. And he had picked cotton all of his life. And he had registered that summer in 1964 with the Mississippi Freedom Democratic Party. And he registered to vote because at that time, because the three civil rights workers had been killed not too far from where he lived in Mississippi. And he would later say, I just didn't think that their lives should be in vain, so I decided I would register. Because see, registering to vote, and a lot of you uh, meant death in Mississippi. It not only meant death, it meant he would, you know, and he had nine kids at the time. So he went into the booth to cast his vote that fall, and he took his little granddaughter with him because he couldn't read. And so she went in there, she had to read the ballot to her grandfather. Well, she's running for district attorney. legislators. <laughs> and so ever since I walked out of that booth that day with my grandfather, it was about justice, it was about leveling the playing field. I apologize. That's all it's right. Like, it's a long campaign. That's all train. right. And that's what I've been doing my entire career. When I was in the district attorney's office, I created a reentry program for men and women who were returning home from prison. I diversified an office. Eric Gonzalez was one of the great byproducts of that. You know, and we do what we do in places that are most uncomfortable. And being a district attorney is certainly not the place where most African-American and Latino children want to be. But what I learned from that experience, because I later integrated a school that same year, was that we go places where nobody else wants to go because that's where you have the greatest impact. And you have to have it outside the office and you have to have it in the office. So what I'm talking about, this is our last civil rights frontier. Because if we don't get justice now, we will never have social progress in our community. And that's what the district attorney's office is really about. We've got to end mass incarceration. I talk about the charges that I'm not gonna charge because those have been part and parcel of what is happening here in this community. In other communities, it's other charges. But I am running to restore the legitimacy in this system. And when I say legitimacy, I mean fairness, integrity, transparency, and equity. I've been a crime fighter. I was here in the 90s fighting the drug dealers. I was the chief of narcotics. So that Eric could get out and come be a district attorney. So that we could go where he needed to go. I've been a civil rights crusader for 14 years here. I brought a dead civil rights agency to life so that people who had no voice could have a voice. People could walk, get a, get a, 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 a get their chairs and places, and you know, and have a voice in our community. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much. Right, Mark, thank you. Thank you so much. <laughs> He's on the job. <laughs> Community, this is the most important.
important election that's going to impact our lives. It is critical for you to really dig deep and see who is who sitting before you. I worked at the Brooklyn District Attorney's Office for t over 21 years. During the course of my service, I handled cases, big cases. I put away murderers, I put away rapists, and I fought for our children. You see, I did things in terms of solving problems, creating programs, way before I was running for district attorney. Way before I sat on the executive floor and being able to see what was going on in the Brooklyn District Attorney's Office. I was the only one four years ago that understood the importance for our community that we needed to change. We had to move from Hines and we needed somebody different. And I sat at the table with Ken Thompson and helped him make that move. So now we're looking at what's gonna be the next step. Well, community, my biggest concern is that people are gonna start going backwards and the Heinz regime will continue to grow. Take a look, don't be fooled. Now, one of the things that I need to do is that we need to rebuild that trust. That trust is critical and we see it how it unfolds in the wrongful conviction cases because to date, nobody has been held accountable. That's a problem. Remember, family, I told you, 23 people have been wrongfully convicted. Out of the 23, 21 are people of color. No one has been held accountable. They'll say, and I've been told I was naive, I was told I was disingenuous. Really? When it comes to justice for the community and for you and for me? It matters. It matters that we don't have two standards of justice in this county. Because, yes, there's a whole issue with cash bail and low-level crimes. And I'm not going to do a handle, I'm not going to have cash bail regarding low-level crimes. Because, you see, in Rikers, those who stay and who are stuck, they look like me. And those who are able to get out, they have means that so many of us don't have generationally. So it does matter who becomes your next Brooklyn District Attorney. You look at my record, you can even see how I've been treated. Hmm, don't sleep on that, women. No, no, no. Women of color, don't sleep on that. This is real, this is real because the criminal justice system impacts our lives every single day. And you know what? I'm not riding on anybody's coattails. and not empty promises. Look today on the internet, WNYC. You know there's a story about what was going on with the marijuana cases and the people whose cases were dismissed and the people whose cases weren't dismissed. I don't think that it will surprise the NAACP or anybody in this room that white people's cases were dismissed more often than people of color. Please look at WNYC's analysis of it. I think you guys need to look at what's really going on in that courthouse. Last night, I was there with my law students, and they were appalled at what they saw. There was one young woman who left the courthouse, and she and her legal aid attorney were talking to me. She was bipolar, and you know what she told me? She said she had, she had been charged with um, tampering about had to do with drugs. And what she, her lawyer said, and what she said she did, was that an undercover officer came up to her and said, where can I buy weed? She took the undercover officer to where he could buy weed, he got the weed, and I said to the lawyer, did she have any money on her? No. Did she have any weed on her? No. She got no benefit at all from bringing that undercover officer to that place to buy the weed. And you know what she said to me? Me and my friend were targeted because we are bipolar. It broke my heart. It broke my law student's heart. That's, and you know what happened yesterday? You know what plea offer she was offered? A violation. You know what that does for her? It starts the snowball effect. First she has a violation, then God forbid so she had something, she's riding a bicycle on a sidewalk and she doesn't answer that violation. Then there's a warrant and then it just snowballs out of control. So people who have no, who have no means or no advocacy end up 
with, with the penalizing poverty, ends up caught up in the criminal justice system, and ends up with all of this against them. That is what we are having today in our courthouse. I was a public defender after I was a prosecutor. I hear from the public defenders every day, and you have to run. You have to make this better. You have to make it better for our clients. Because the mass part of mass incarceration is what happens every single day in that courthouse. It's not the couple of cases that are reported by the media. It's not the couple of cases you hear about. It's the cases you don't hear about every single day that creates mass incarceration. <laughs> affect communities of color. It's the cases you don't hear about every day that penalize poverty. And if you want a district attorney that will speak honestly about these issues and look at them honestly and speak to you honestly and has already done an annual report on a drug treatment alternative to prison program, so you know I can do an annual report, please vote for Ann Swern on September 12th. I'm the first name on the ballot because the lottery picked me first. Right under where it says DA, it says Ann Swern. All right, family. We've been together now. Some of us since a quarter to five. Some of us since four thirty. I want to thank you to the audience and then audience if you can join me. And so I invite them, Those some of them are already members, but if you're not a member of Brooklyn NAACP, to not be a member of the organization simply to have your name on a card. Um, but if you're going to join this organization, we need in this current time, we need lawyers, we need people who are committed to justice. Um, to be part of this organization to help us do that old-fashioned work of hitting the streets and suing people and knocking on doors in order to bring justice um, and restorative justice in our communities. So we invite the candidates to do that, and whoever wins, we know that we will be out celebrating with you, but we will also, at the same time, <laughs> hold you accountable. This information is not enough for our online audience to share this feed into it is imperative that on Tuesday, what time do the polls open? 6 a.m. 6 a.m. Now listen, the Center for Law and Social Justice has been committed to protecting voter rights since the, we started 31 years ago. But we can do great on voter registration. Now it's time for voter activation, right? We can we think are important. We can determine how justice should look for our communities here in Central Brooklyn. So Bed-Stuy, Crown Heights, oh, East New York, Flatbush, all everywhere in between, Brownsville, and everywhere else in between, we need you to show up. Now, I have, I have some dogs in this fight. We all have dogs in this fight. Choose who you think is going to align most with your with your preferences, but most importantly, choose, be present, be a part of making this decision so that we can hold them accountable standing on two legs. So thank you again. Um, on your way out, we're going to close now, but on your way out, please take a flyer in the information about our town hall on body-worn cameras. This is really important because right now, the NYPD is only keeping the footage at one police plaza. Right now, the NYPD is only suggesting the data be kept on one server when all the all across the country, the best practices are in case of a flood, in case of a hurricane, making sure that there are redundancy, right? Um, and then there's the option in terms of how the camera we chose, um, got chose, right? 
I'm sorry, as you're exiting, we're still talking. Thank you, thank you. Um, and so it's really important. I know it sounds like a bland issue in terms of body-worn cameras, but this is one aspect. This is one aspect of our accountability, but this town hall is really important um, to do that. And then on our membership meeting at the end of this month as well, um, we'll be talking about the constitutional um, convention question on the ballot for November. So if you have questions about that, if you don't know whether you should vote yes or no, you should come out to our membership meeting, which is there's a flyer also on the table, so we can have a discussion about the constitutional convention question that will be on the ballot in November. All right, so you'll have to turn the ballot over to answer that question, and there are serious consequences um, in terms of what the decision is um, that we vote in November, so it's really important that you come out. Finally, we want to thank you from Medgar Evers College, Center for Law and Social Justice. We encourage you, if you or someone you know is seeking legal advice, please contact us. You can visit our website at clsj.org. We will provide you with a referral to either an agency or an attorney who can help you out. We are here for the community. We were founded by activist attorneys in the community. And so we do ask that you remember us when you or someone you know is seeking legal assistance. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.